Is that better? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Super. Oh, how are you? Good. Um, it's, it's early, uh, especially for summer vacation, and so I, uh, I very much appreciate all of you being here today. Just want to make sure this is all working here. Set up. Most of it. Woohoo! Excellent. Um, as I think Stig mentioned, uh, for me it's actually about 2.30 in the morning. So if at any point during the talk I sort of <laughs> just wake me up and we'll carry on and, and that'll be great. Um, I want to begin actually by asking how many of you here are on Twitter? Okay, a few. Uh, you'll see my my Twitter handle is there, so I will be calling on those of you who use Twitter a little later in the presentation. Um, there is no pressure to use Twitter, uh, but if you do wish to live tweet during, no problem, and you're welcome to use my, my Twitter handle. I always enjoy the sort of the back channel discussion that emerges from a talk when you have people who are sharing parts <coughs> of it with their own networks. The reason that I asked about Twitter wasn't for that, though. Um, it was actually just to, as a way of introducing the, the title and the concept of network education. Because mm -hmm. I do a fair amount of my educational work within networks, including Twitter. And what I want to do today with you is actually use some thinking tools or conceptual tools to build an idea. And that idea is network education. And that is not the forward button, and that is. Very good. Um, this is me about two haircuts ago. Uh, and who am I? Well, I live in Prince Edward Island in Canada, the smallest province in Canada. Um, sort of the, I think it's the Gotland of Canada, perhaps. Um, it's, it's a pastoral island. Um, I work at the University of Prince Edward Island. I am a PhD researcher there, uh, and also a coordinator of adult learning programs and online programs. And my work in my research as an educator, as a writer, and as a social media researcher all focuses around the ideas of networks and digital literacies and digital identities and who are we when we're online. And so last January, when I had the opportunity to go to London, to Bet, and work with some Swedish teachers there, including some people who are here today, um, I was fascinated because they said, well, Sweden, Different municipalities are in the process of rolling out this one-to-one -one plan. And I said, really? Because the work that I do in Canada, so often when I try to talk about digital literacies and digital pedagogies and network education, people get stuck on the tools the shiny gadgets, the here's an app, here's an iPhone, or where's my app, where's my iPhone, where's my Wi-Fi? Because in Canada, and in my school district, and most of the school districts in Canada, we are nowhere near the infrastructure, or the political will, or the technical capacity to actually roll out a program like the one-to-one -one program that you have here. And so it ends up being the tools that are a block <coughs> to having the conversation. Um, I actually don't think that the tools are the most important part of the conversation. But the fact that you are leaders in this area and have the tools makes it a great deal easier and very exciting for me to have this conversation about what we could do with them. Um, because, 
so long as people think about the idea of technology as something that is shiny and does something, that often gets in the way of the kind of education that I'm going to talk about today. I want you to know um, that many parents, educators, and educational leaders in North America are actually quite impressed with and jealous of the situation that you have here, um, or at least the opportunity that you have here. This is a series of tweets uh, from two parents in Ontario and Canada talking about the fact that uh, the, the woman on top has teenage adult, uh, almost adult sons. Uh, one has a fairly profound um, learning disability and uh, ADHD diagnosis. Um, and over the past number of years, she has worked very closely with him to help him build sort of day-to-day -day coping skills and strategies based on the use of his phone. And then he goes to school, and he is not allowed any device in the school whatsoever. And so all of the, the literacies that this young man has learned in order to manage the challenges that he has, he's not allowed to bring into the school environment. At the same time, and this may be true here as well, North Americans at least, and North American teachers in particular, I teach teachers and I teach um, both pre-service and practicing teachers, are terrified of what the idea of having a classroom full of students with a device would mean. There is a feared loss of control, okay? and there is also a very strong cultural narrative, and the work that Dana Boy does is largely around that cultural narrative that teachers and students online should never mix. That this kind of networking is dangerous or uncomfortable. Is that true at all here, or is, is there an openness to some level of student-teacher interaction in open networks like Twitter or Facebook? Largely, yes. Yeah. Fair enough, because Facebook is perceived as more personal, I think, pretty much worldwide at this point. Okay, that's, that's interesting and helpful for me. Thank you. Um, so, this is the, these are the cultural narratives in which my work sits in its context in Canada. Yes. And is that, so your students' parents, are they comfortable with you being on Facebook with their children? <laughs> they haven't said nothing yet. Fair enough. And, and that's great. I have long felt that part of what happened within at least the North American context, when Facebook came out, the US, and in Canada we're very driven by a lot of what happens in the US, uh, the US was, deep in the throes of stranger danger, right? The idea that we should never ever talk to someone that your parents haven't approved of yet. And so what we did when Facebook became common is we essentially created two entirely separate streams or networks um, and we left the kids to their own. The problem with that, of course, we don't do that in any other aspect of human society. When you send children out onto the playground to play, generally you send a supervisor and you talk about the kinds of behaviors that are acceptable to do on a playground and you intervene when you see problems occurring. But in North America, at least what we did with Facebook seven or eight years ago is we went, oh my goodness, close the door. And then about three years later, we turned around and went, they're not being nice to each other. What a surprise, because they had no models, right? And, and no expectations that they would behave differently. So that network piece, uh, it's been shown in the work of Dana Boyd, who I just had on um, the previous tweet, that if you have robust networks of adults, 
and students who know each other. More. I could go on my own child's Facebook account if my children were old enough, but I will not know all of those children in the way that a teacher knows all of those children. And they will not necessarily mitigate or change their behavior based on my presence. <coughs> but if it is the norm to have a space like that, then you can also model different kinds of behavior. So there's, there's some really interesting pieces around that. The work that I do and the stuff that I want to talk about today, you'll see that I am, sadly, I am not. <laughs> Uh, a, a design genius. Um, but this is meant to be a very rough representation of the pedagogical side of networked education. And at the bottom, you'll see the word inquiries. And that is intended to represent student inquiries. That learning comes from student inquiries. The networked piece comes next. Leading from those student inquiries, we use the different capabilities of digital media to do something with those inquiries that we couldn't do with print. Okay. One of the biggest things for me um, when I think about network education is it's very, very important to try not to just take your books and slap them online and call it a good day. Because print as a medium works in particular ways. <laughs> and digital media work differently. Right? Digital media are replicable. If I have a book here and it's the last book of its kind, well now we can photocopy it. But a hundred years ago it was the last book of its kind. Right? And even if it is photocopied, it is not the same object. Digital media, instantly replicable. Digital media is instantly scalable, so that you are familiar with the term virality, or if something goes viral. Do you know what I mean? That's scale at work. When, if you were to tweet something that for whatever reason was scandalous, or really exciting, or so brilliant and witty, that 200 people wanted to share it. And one of those 200 people had 200,000 followers, and then it leapt out to that many more people. That's scaling. You can't scale print media, right? You can't replicate it in the same ways. You can't search it in the same, day, in the same ways. Print media has an index. Books have an index at the back but it does not operate according to the same terms. And so the potential in networks, the potential in networked education is when you take student inquiry and you use those special capacities of digital media to do something with those inquiries that you couldn't already do. If you can use print media to do the thing you're trying to do, do it. Print media is pretty good at what it does, right? There is no reason even in a one-to-one -one classroom to necessarily throw out all print media unless you don't have print anymore. But you may have, students may do some writing as well as some keyboarding. And those things are, are fine. But please think about asking yourself to go beyond and use those capacities of digital media in the service of pedagogy. At the top of it all is pedagogy, or the reason why we teach. This is really what I'm going to talk about today. This is the structure. Um, basically, I want to use the tools, the, uh, the thinking tools or the conceptual tools, to build an idea of networked education with you. I want to talk about the context of network education, right? this time that we live in. I want to talk about a specific pedagogical approach. And then I want to talk about goals a little bit. And that will really be our discussion. The first question is, what is education for? And sometimes 
at least in, in my own experience as a teacher and with teachers, we are so busy being asked to deliver education that the opportunity to sit back and say, what are we doing this for? What is the purpose of what we do is not always there enough. But when we think about the purpose of education, I don't think we can talk about it without talking about the idea of literacy. So even though I have literacies as number three, sort of the goals pieces for education, um, in truth it will inform this whole discussion. The literacies that we are looking to develop in students and the literacies that you have the opportunity to develop in one-to-one -one classrooms include the literacies that you would have learned in school. Those still have value. Reading, writing, arithmetic. But there are also new literacies that digital media make possible and necessary. If anyone was in my talk in January and that this, this next little series will, will be familiar. Um, this is my little history lesson on literacy. It's very short. This is Socrates, the wisest man in Athens. He lived at the very end of a time that saw a kind of sea change, perhaps parallel to the one that we are living through today. And in his time, he was almost at the apex of the sort of knowledgeable man who did not write. He used his memory to impart his wisdom. He valued memory. And he actually railed against writing and the idea that it would destroy people's capacity to remember in the way that meant knowledge to him. The irony of Socrates, of course, is that if Plato, his student, hadn't written everything he said down, we would have no idea who he was. Um, but he was probably right. I imagine that none of us, I may be wrong, please raise your hand, can anybody in the audience today stand up and recite the entire Odyssey and Iliad by heart? I don't need you to do it. I can't. There was a time when that was a mark of learned knowledge, and that was, to an extent, also the limit of that. When writing came in and took over, we saw a shift to a different kind of knowledge that was valued. And that kind of knowledge was preserved, certainly in the European context, developed and then preserved through the church for millennia, a millennium. And then with the advent of the pr printing press, you saw a very different kind of cultural shift opening up again, where average people, instead of monks and priests, maybe nuns, gained some access to knowledge in a way that generally had not been available before, right? And the idea of mass-produced knowledge didn't happen immediately, but it began to be a cultural possibility. With the literacy to read and decode text also came, people started to write text. Right? In the time of the monks in the scriptoria, for the most part, what was known and what was knowledge was already written. The job of a monk wasn't to make up new parts of things. Right? It was to write down what was there in the Bible or what had been said in a papal edict, and that was it. Suddenly, people began to contribute to knowledge. Now, as we go through this and there are many shifts in there. This, like I said, this is a condensed version. <laughs> but as we go through this shift, this is a, um, a slide from Khan Academy, which is a free online educational site, uh, corporate, that is actually teaching about the ancient Greeks, not Socrates, but Euclid. Um, 
in a way that allows students to go in and test themselves on their mastery of concepts. If you are going to do your entire education through something like Khan Academy, you would need to have an incredible level of not only self-direction, right, which is a literacy unto itself, but critical thinking skills and synthesis skills, because in the world that something like Khan Academy exists in, how many of you have heard the phrase, you know, our students now, and your students for sure, have basically all the knowledge of humankind sitting in their pockets? Yeah, it's, it's becoming a truism, and it is true. How many of you think your students know how to use it real good? Oh, good. <laughs> I find that for the most part, my students, even the ones who are so-called digital natives, do <coughs> definitely need some guidance, scaffolding, and focus, thinking tools, for managing the kind of information abundance that they live in. Because that's where we live. And if you can't, synthesize all those pieces that come at you through there, everything starts to seem a little bit strange sometimes. That idea of information abundance is the idea that we live in a constant running stream of information and knowledge Sometimes it feels like being hit in the face with a water hose. You can never take it all in. You can never master it all. Right? And what we need to be able to do, the literacy that is most key, perhaps, in this era, is to be able to make some sense out of things in the middle of that, to choose the pieces that are relevant. That idea of information abundance is deeply premised in the idea of networks. Networks are a way of making sense of information abundance. If you can pick out one, two, three, four <coughs> discrete water droplets in the spray, and connect them, and figure out what they mean. You've, also, you've missed a thousand, but you have made some form of meaning. It may be very different for water droplets than the person next to you in your class, which means that to network education changes our role as teachers as well, because some of those we expect everyone to learn the same thing, may not be a reasonable expectation for teachers anymore, although it tends to still be an expectation placed on us. <laughs> the next couple of tweets will make it look like everyone on Twitter is named George. Uh, this is George Station retweeting George Siemens, saying we're going from systems to networks. Our entire structure of thinking and societal work is moving in a direction where that concept of complete mastery is no longer functional. And what we need to be able to do is pick out pieces and connect them. We will never get all of the pieces. Another George. Um, at the same time, in that information stream, the term information abundance sounds very cold and calculating. But in that abundance is so much humanity. And if you do spend any time on social networks, you will see a ton of mundane things, the what people had for lunch, the stuff you might not want to see, whatever. But you will also see genuine forms of human expression and contribution. And being able to navigate some of the Discomfort. Most of us were raised and educated within systems. 
And in systems and institutions, there tends to be a fairly clean separation between private and public that to some extent is collapsed in networks. And that can be uncomfortable, but that open sharing as a model, as a practice, can also be really valuable for helping people find things to connect to in that stream that hits us all in the face. So, in terms of these thinking tools, to network education is to model and share the literacies for making sense and contributing knowledge within information abundance. But abundance is hard to deal with. Sometimes it's too much. Clay Shirky is a theorist of the internet, and he says, oh, there's, there's no such thing as information overload. It's only filter failure. <laughs> and, and he may be right, but do you folks ever feel like your, your filters have failed <laughs> and you get overloaded? I get overloaded. I live in networks uh, uh, too much of the time, perhaps, and I still get overloaded, no matter how much literacy and comfort I build, because sometimes you can't make the connections. <coughs> and those of us who did grow up under different kinds of systems, we learned a certain level of media literacy growing up. I don't know in Sweden, in, in North America, when I was a child, Saturday morning cartoons were a big thing. My family, my mom didn't have cable TV. And so occasionally I would sleep over at my grandparents and I would wake up because I was so excited because instead of one channel with Saturday morning cartoons, they had 12 channels and like three of them had Saturday morning cartoons and it was wonderful. But I learned fairly quickly that all of the commercials in the Saturday morning cartoons were aimed at children. And this was the 70s. Not a lot was actually aimed at children directly. Um, but these Saturday morning cartoon commercials were like all of the unhealthy cereals, all of the toys, all of the crap. And when I watched them, I would be like, ah, oh, I want, I want. And I remember my dear old grandmother, because it was her house, saying one morning, you know, dear, those commercials are intended to make you feel that way, right? Like they're, they're meant to get parents and grandparents to spend money. I hadn't thought about it before, but it was true. And it was one of my first media literacy lessons where slowly, as I grew, I learned to ask questions of my broadcast media. What is this for? Who is paying for it? What is its intention? What is it trying to do with me? And I became reasonably literate in broadcast media. <laughs> the problem is that now our media doesn't just come from broadcast sources, it comes from everywhere. We are in the middle of that constant performance art installation every time our phone dings or every time that we go to read the news, we end up reading 700 different people's interpretation of the news as well. And so this quote here is interesting. Um, she says, the new structure is from one to many networks. And because she condensed it, because it's Twitter, it actually doesn't exactly read the way that I wanted to, but I want to try a little experiment here, okay? Because what she's saying is actually it's from one to many to many to many. And the idea of a one to many network you're all familiar with. Broadcast media is a one to many network. Teaching operates like a one-to-many network. If you imagine me standing up here and saying, my favorite color is red, 
I have now communicated that information to the many of you. We're going to try a many-to-many -many <coughs> visualization. I would ask you, please, kindly, to turn to the people, two people, okay, on either side of you or one behind or whatever, and say, hi, my name is, and my favorite color is, whatever. If you don't have a favorite color, you can just pretend. I think the Swedish words for colors are very long. We are very friendly people. This is good. What I'd like you to imagine now, we'll go back to my example. Imagine when I said my favorite color is red, that a little line, a little red line in that case, between me and each of you was created. So imagine the room essentially covered in little red lines or yarn. Okay? Now, I'd like you to think just about your own statement. Okay? Using whatever color is your favorite color, imagine a little line between you and the two people you spoke to. Okay? Now, imagine, because digital media is replicable and scalable, that each of those two people tells two more people your favorite color. It's not secret personal information, but just imagine that they do. This is so-and-so, and her favorite color is yellow. Imagine those two lines. Imagine they are yellow or whatever color you chose. Can you see what I'm saying? Okay. And then they tell two people. So just kind of picture it moving through the room. Within about six turns, even with only two people, you've hit a large number of yellow or whatever color threads that are going around. That is many to many communications. Are you with me visually? That is what networked education <coughs> can take advantage of in terms of student voice, student communications, student learning. Okay? It's the capacity to create, rather than I, teacher at the front of the room, have the power to give all the messages, it becomes a much more messy ball of yarn, but there is also much more information out there. Not all of it is accurate. Favorite color is pretty safe. But not all of it may be information that you want all the students to just go, okay. okay? So those literacies for dealing with many-to-many -many networks means that people need to be able to think about the conditions of information coming at them, little lines of yarn coming at them from all corners. And if we all had those little lines going between us, you sitting there might have 10 different colors coming at you at the same time. Okay? So that filtering literacy is huge once you start adding real meaning and content to those lines. The great part about it is that rather than simply being consumers of education, networks do allow students to become contributors to their own and to other people's education in a way that print media did not really make possible. You could do that in a classroom. We've been talking for 25 years about student-centered learning. But to go beyond the walls of your classroom was not necessarily possible. Now, pen pals. Now, much easier, much faster, instant, replicable, scalable, searchable. So basically, this is one of the key literacies. This is the context in which we teach. 
right now. We need to be able to help our students live in that constant stream and not drown and give back to them. Great. Thanks so much, no. <laughs> if you find it easy, I would love to know how, and I will be out there at the FICA, just waiting. Um, but if you don't find it easy, this is where I have a little job for the people with Twitter. I would love it if you would share some of the challenges that you experience or think about or perceive with networking education. I made up a hashtag, <laughs> um, network at lean. Um, and if you have any thoughts about your experiences with one-to-one, -one, I will be checking this hashtag sort of running through when we are done and over the FICA. <coughs> and it, what it will provide is also an opportunity for you to see each other, to network with each other, to share a little. The hashtag, for those of you who don't use Twitter, is actually a way of organizing some of those balls of thread so that if you click that hashtag, once people have contributed to it, you will be able to see everyone in this room who has contributed an idea, a challenge, a piece like that. Um, I don't, the reason I picked this one was because it was as short as I could make it and because I didn't think anybody else would just randomly be using it today. Um, we may find a few stray people on there. But that is basically my, my request to you for, for some input as we carry on. And if you think of other pieces that you want to add later, that's great too. Now, as you think about your challenges, I'd like to move from the context of information abundance which I think is really the background. It's why one-to-one -one has potential. It's why one-to-one, -one, from my perspective, matters. Because I think with, without policies that do bring technology to students, that decentering of the teacher can be very difficult to sustain. And it's difficult to sustain anyway. The pedagogical approach is sort of my next step in the piece of how I try to do this. And the biggest piece of it is simply to say the important tools, from my perspective, are not the gadget or the app. So I don't know if all the schools in Sweden in their one-to-one -one policies use the same uh, technologies, devices. Do you use different devices? Okay, great. Do you use different kinds of apps depending on what you teach? Great. Do you ever get a narrative that there is, you must try this one, it's really the, the great one? Because certainly in the North American context, that is one of the dominant pieces of many technologically based initiatives in education. They are often driven by Silicon Valley who happily, handily build these nice little technologies and they would like to sell them to you in the guise of pedagogy. I don't think that the individual technology is really the center of what we are doing. And particularly when we talk about networked education. Because networks are not entirely online based ever. Right? And my, my favorite example is when I ask people, do you have a network offline? And sometimes people will go, well, I guess. Maybe I'll say, do you have a family? And they go, oh, yes, I do. Or I do. <laughs> Depends. Families operate like networks in the sense that each person is a node and may have very different relationships with the other nodes than another person in the same family. So 
Let's imagine you have a brother. I don't know if you have a brother. Let's imagine that you and Auntie Susan, Inga, I don't know. <laughs> you get along very well. But your brother and Auntie Susan Inga don't get along at all. That, just three nodes, is a networked type of relationship. It is not the same as a group. You all belong to the same group, the same family. But in a network, it's the individual relationships that are key. Okay? So we all have offline networks anyway. You have colleagues, right? You're here today, I'm assuming, with your colleagues. Um, you have parents, students, people in your own lives. They are all parts of your learning network, teaching network, even if they're not formally involved in education. The great thing about the digital technology side of things, no matter which ones you're using, Almost all digital gadgets can connect you with other people in some way. And, and so that's where it is the actual connecting that matters a great deal more than the platform you're doing it on. But when we talk about literacies, the biggest push and the biggest conceptual tool new tech with old approaches does not equal new literacies. There are some Australian scholars who call the new approach that they recommend the new ethos. And that's um, sort of the center of, of my approach to new literacies. And this is a big quote, and I apologize because it's a lot of text on the screen. But they say what is central to new literacies is not looking stuff up, or going online, or using a digital tool rather than an analog tool. <clears throat> it's that a new ethos approach, a new pedagogy, mobilizes different values, priorities, and sensibilities. And so they say that you can have new tech stuff, right? This is new tech stuff. That iPad is new tech stuff. But if you don't have those different values and priorities, you don't have new literacies. So if, if I am the teacher in a one-to-one -one <coughs> classroom and you're all there with your devices, and I go up and I say, you know, Please use your device to go to this app, but it's written like a worksheet, right? And complete it and hand it in to me. Thank you. Goodbye. I could have done that with paper. And more so, it kept me at the center of things. And what you learned, besides whatever was on the app or the worksheet, was that your job as a learner is to do what I tell you, to learn what I tell you, and call it a good day. And that is not new literacies work. You can actually do new literacies work without tech, so long as it is learner-driven, participatory, differentiated, and experiential. Now, again, I'm never sure how words translate into Swedish. Are those words all somewhat clear? Learner-driven, meaning that the learn, again, back to the idea of student inquiry at the bottom of everything, at the root of everything. Participatory means that the students have some opportunity to engage, not just as a, I will fill this out now, person. Differentiated means you and you might be doing different things. Experiential means that there is some element of 
hands-on, whether it is even mentally hands-on, envisioning yourself in the shoes of a different experience. Right? Those are the key pieces to sort of a new ethos or new literacies approach. And if you have those, but you don't have the gadgets, you can still be doing sort of new literacies work. How many of you are familiar with the concept of genius hour? Awesome, okay. Uh, how many of you teach in primary? Any of this is all secondary? Okay, a couple of you teach in, in primary? Okay, many of you teach in primary, great. Genius Hour actually, and I, I just said mean things about Silicon Valley, but Genius Hour came out of Google. And it is actually a company policy at um, many of the tech startup companies in the US. They try to have a culture of innovation and they value innovation. And what they found was that if they allowed their employees 20% of their time at work to do their own stuff, inquiry-driven stuff, right? Inquiry at the bottom. Then they actually got better productivity and more innovation in the other 80% of the time. Okay. What happened in some North American schools over the last five, eight years is that teachers have adopted this concept, just the 80-20 rule for time. Because obviously we have curriculum that we are required to teach and go through, but they instituted this practice where let's say 20% of the time in maybe even only one day a week, maybe it was only 20% of Thursday, the students knew that they had this time to do their own thing. Before it could succeed, the teachers often had to teach the kids how to unlearn the idea that they had to just do what they were told. Because, and this may happen sometimes for you folks in your classrooms, right? When you first open things up in a classroom and you say, go, do wonderful, miss, what am I supposed to do? Because we spend so much time acculturating children to schooling and to doing it right. The teachers who took the time to sort of build in uh, and teach their students essentially how to do inquiry processes had some really interesting successes with this idea of genius hour. Again, these are mostly North American schools, and often, although not exclusively, primary, meaning early years, little kids. Most of them have very little technology. The students' inquiry projects were often craft-based, art-based, paper-based, technology if they could scrounge it up, but they were not about the technology. They didn't even have the capacity to use a lot of digital networking with them, but that sense that the kids could drive their own boat or car for that period of time makes a concept like Genius Hour a new literacy concept. And it's that idea of who gets to make the decisions and how will we value this piece and how will we show it and share it because many of them then had school fairs where they showed off these projects or tried to give them an audience. And we'll come back to talking about audience when we get formally into the literacies piece. So when I think about education, I do think about literacies as really a key goal of what we're doing and a key purpose for our work in classrooms. But there's pushback. And very often I hear 
But what about the PISA test? I see you have the PISA test too. <laughs> um, we're very concerned on Prince Edward Island, where I live. We have the worst PISA math scores in Canada. We're also the poorest province in Canada, but we don't seem to talk about that connection. We keep talking about how the teachers must not be teaching math correctly. Um, and I struggle in the middle of this conversation about measurement and education because I think it's important because I am a teacher and I know that my cultural role, that what's expected of me is to somehow produce particular kinds of knowledge that are valued and that can be ranked, and so then my school can be ranked, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm uncomfortable in the middle of these conversations because I think that it's true that we have to have some ways of measuring learning. But I've spent the past four or five years really struggling with this question and the piece that I keep coming up against, for me, for my particular pedagogical position is, yeah, I understand that as teachers, we, we are obliged, culturally, to measure learning. And I understand that most of public society believes that our job is to measure learning and that we have to measure learning. But when I think about learning, as literacies of synthesizing information in the middle of information abundance, I don't think we can measure all learning that matters. And increasingly, I think that the narratives that push for standardization, standardized tests, measurement, rankings, are almost like the last gasp of an old institutional system where what was known... <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I was kind of afraid you would throw tomatoes, and you were welcome to throw tomatoes as well. Just get my raincoat. Um, the last gasp of an old institutional system that saw knowledge in a much more constrained way and the pressure on you and me is that we are educators in a time where that standardization narrative is politically powerful, it's on the rise all over the world, at the same time that we're being told, network them, send them out with technology, do wonderful things, because we can be all things to all people. And it was funny, about two o'clock this morning, so my body is still on Eastern Canada time, like I mentioned at the beginning, and so I did try to go to sleep at what I thought was supper time last night, but that did not go well. And so eventually I gave up, and I got up about two o'clock in the morning here, and I opened my computer, and I went on Twitter, as I do, and I realized that Robin Williams had died, which I, I think most of you may have heard. Um, and I grew up watching Robin Williams in Mork and Mindy uh, when I was a little kid and all of his movies through my teen and adult years. And I, I was a fan of Robin Williams, um, but it was particularly Dead Poets Society, mm -hmm. which came out when I was 17. And just sort of before I went into teaching, that was quite inspirational for me. And I was thinking about this keynote in the morning and wondering if I would be able to stay awake. Um, and I was thinking about Dead Poets Society, and I, I remembered the scene, and how many of you have seen the film? Okay, it's Room of Teachers, yeah? yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm not a total romantic and all those things, but do you remember the scene where he has the student read out of the book of J. Evans Pritchard's poetry, and the student is reading along, and Robin Williams is dutifully graphing on the board, and he says, okay, so you can judge a poem's worth by 
the P axis and the S axis, and Keats would fill up this much space, but Shakespeare, a sonnet by Shakespeare, would fill up this much space, and then he turns to the students and he says, excrement, meaning bullshit, frankly, in more common English. And he says, rip it out. Rip it out, boys. And there is a piece of me that really believes that if we are going to do truly networked education, we're not going to solve this tomorrow, probably in our teaching careers. But we need to find ways to build the groundwork for a recognition of literacies and learning that goes beyond the little box of what you can put on tests. And we need to find ways to start ripping that out because otherwise we're doing two untenable things at the same time. So to the weight, what about measurements and standardization? I think of them right now as essentially necessary evils that we are bound to. <laughs> um, but I don't think of them as the goals for education. A networked education connects, cultivates, and curates. And by curates, to curate is to filter. It's something, until five years ago, the word curate in English was only used to refer to the work of librarians and like art gallery people, right? And so the curator of an art gallery would say, oh, that painting, that one, we'll put them together and make a nice exhibition. Now, those of you who have a Twitter account are probably curating links on a constant basis. Oh, this one I will share. This one I will not. This one I will retweet and comment on. That is a constant form of filtering, synthesizing, and connecting or standing with communications. Networked education does all those things, but it cannot control or count in the same ways as conventional institutional education. And if we want to do really innovative one-to-one -one education, we can't be doing it just to control or count in the same ways that the old system was designed to do. It will not. You will end up doing one-to-one -one education with glorified toys. So, instead of that, the literacies that I propose are valuable and important in this network age. And the next little bit is drawn very heavily from the work of Howard Rheingold. Are you guys familiar with Howard Rheingold? He's on, for those of you on Twitter, he's on Twitter, uh, I believe it's H Rheingold, R H. E-I-N-G-O-L-D, I believe. He is um, an elder in this area, and uh, he does some pretty good work. Um, I, I recommend taking a look at his stuff, but the piece that I particularly like is this idea of literacies of attention, because I think it's something that all of us struggle with. Um, I'm always, comfortable when people are using devices to engage with what I'm doing as a teacher, as a speaker. Um, it's, it's been years for me, and so I, I'm, I'm okay in this space. But how many of you remember the first time that you were speaking or talking, perhaps in a classroom, and a bunch of people had a device? How did that feel? Little, little awkward. <laughs> Yeah, because some of the social cues, right, that we use to show that we're listening, and you guys actually give great eye contact, by the way, like, thank you, audience. Um, but some of, the, some of those social cues don't always get sustained when people are engaging with their device. And you always hope that they're actually engaging with what you're saying in some marvelous way, but they also could be making a grocery list or checking Facebook, or all of the above. 
right? Because we live in a state that Reingold calls continuous partial attention. Does that resonate for anybody? We are increasingly asked to do many, many things in our lives in information abundance. Things are always coming at us. And so we are kind of half giving our attention to, to many things at once. His perspective is that one of the keys to teaching students to be fully literate citizens is to help them become a little bit more aware of their attention as a commodity that they can control. And so he apparently does something in his classes that I would love to try with you guys, if you're willing. What I'm gonna ask you to do is actually just put down whatever device you have. You'll get to pick it up really soon, I promise. Just put it in your lap. And then he asks them to close their eyes for a minute and actually just do nothing and fight the urge to change that state. So if you're willing to participate, you don't have to. You can take pictures of everyone else sitting there with their eyes closed and <laughs> say you all slept through it. But um, if you're willing, I'm gonna give us a minute and I'm gonna ask you just to sort of let your mind drift. And please open your eyes. <coughs> How did that feel? Awkward? Strange? No? Comfortable? How do you feel after? Is it harder to bring your, your ears and eyes back to me or easier? Both. I hear both from a couple of people. One of the things that Rheingold says is that when we let our attention go, we sometimes become more aware of the ways that we are spending it. And there is often an initial process of self-consciousness because we have become so conditioned to constantly managing partial attention that to actually just stop and do something, especially in a large group, can feel socially strange. Um, but he also suggests that doing something like that with students can point out to them, and I think this might be of value in a one-to-one -one classroom sometimes, just to say, we're just going to start now. If you want to pick up your device again, before you do, I'd like you to think intentionally about what you plan to do with it. And had I asked you a minute ago to tell me what you were about to do with the device in your hand, I think that would have been a disruptive question. But when you've made the break, then to ask people to think before stepping back into that abundance can actually be more effective. So thank you very much for being willing participants in, in trying that. I've never gotten to do it with such a large group before. <laughs> um, that literacy of attention is something that our many generations need to be modeling for our students and practicing as much as they need to be modeling and practicing it. One of the other key literacies that students really need to learn in a context of information abundance is how to contribute. I mentioned earlier that networks are different from groups. One of the key differences in networks and groups is that 
even though this is a large group today, those of you who know each other and work together might see someone later and they'll say, hey, was so-and-so there? And you think in your mind, oh, yeah, I think they were. Yeah, I saw, I saw him or I saw her, right? Online in a network, it's infinite. You do not know who is there. And if you do not signal, if you do not contribute, if you do not let other people know you are there, it's fine to lurk. It's totally okay. And you may not want to let other people know you are there. But if your students would like to make an impact of any kind in a network world, they have to have competency and modeling for how to contribute in positive ways. Because if we do fully make the shift to knowledge and literacies that are not bounded by institutional groupings, the people who can't spit it out and put something out there will be severely disadvantaged. And it actually fits with some pretty good pedagogy stuff as well. Um, we've been saying in education for 25, 30 years, again, that real world audiences make a difference. One of the things that, again, you can safely scaffold some of these things, but one of the things that digital technologies make possible is these real world audiences. So this is, um, this is the blog site, it's a screen capture from the blog site of a little tiny country school in Prince Edward Island. And last winter, I was teaching a communications course for pre-service teachers um, at the university, which is about, it's about a half hour drive between the university and this little school in the country. The school goes from kindergarten to grade nine. So it serves a small community, and then they go to a, what we call a feeder school or a big school for high school. I was contacted by the grade seven teacher, one grade seven class, um, because he was doing blogging. And I have blogged for a long time, and there are not very many people who blog on PEI. And so he called me and he said, can you come out and do a presentation to my grade seven students about blogging? And I said, sure. So I drove out, I talked to the grade seven students, they were nice, it was good. And then he emailed me when I got home. And he said, could we do something with the university? Like with the, maybe the education students or something? I just feel like if my students are just blogging for each other, it's not really gonna go anywhere. And I said, hmm. I applied to teach a communications course. Now at this time I hadn't heard for sure if I'd gotten the contract for my communications course. But I did then, I heard and I said, okay. I have this contract to teach education students. You have grade seven students. I wanna teach networked communications. Can we make a real world audience for each other? And so what we did was through the month of February this year, his students, grade seven, had to write four blog posts. He had 16 students. I had 38 students. And each of my 38 students had to make three comments on each of two students' posts. His students, would write their blogs publicly. My students could comment publicly and privately. So they gave some more critical feedback, like grammar and stuff like that, in the private blog comments. But they, at least two of the comments to each student had to be public. And they were intended to help my students learn about networked communications, because they only had 16 kids in the grade seven class and I had 38, so each of those 16 kids had about five of my students commenting. And so part of my students' role was to start a conversation in those blog comments, to, to keep building, keep engaging the students back, build with each other and on each other, to sort of create a positive discussion space around what these students had written. 
it was also intended to give them practice doing formative assessment, right? So give that relational one-to-one, -one, this is how you're doing, this is how it affects me, and this is what I understand that you've learned, and at the same time, this might be what I would also be looking for. Because my students don't get a lot of practice with that, or if they do, it's with each other. And there's something kind of fake about pretending that your peer sitting across from you is a grade seven student. So, we figured we'd try it. It was one of the best things I have ever done in terms of just hands-on learning. My students loved it. They were actually motivated. And this class, my class of 38, were pretty like, whatever, about a lot of stuff. They loved this. It felt to them like they were being real teachers. The way that our program works is they're in class for like 10 weeks, and then they go teach for four weeks, and then they're in class for 10 weeks. And during those 10 weeks of class, they don't feel like they get to do real teacher stuff. But this was real teacher stuff for them. His students were amazing. And the, the, the development in their blogs during that period of time was really, really good. A real world audience doesn't have to mean whole world audience. You can set up effective partnerships even across different grades in a school. But that kind of, my students couldn't have driven out to that school, it was too far. But they could connect with these students as real world teaching experiences just using the blogs. So that was one literacy. They both got to contribute in a way that mattered. <laughs> Connection. Um, also really cool. I don't know if any of you know Ola, but I met Ola in uh, London last year. He's a Swedish teacher. And he followed me on Twitter and we chatted back and forth now and then. And one of my students in that same class wanted to go to Sweden to do one of his practicum um, at the end of, of the year. And so I said, hey, you might want to talk to Ola. This is just a tiny snippet of a longer series of conversations that they ended up having, which were really helpful to my student. He didn't know anybody in Sweden from a hole in the wall. He just thought he'd like to go to Sweden. Never met anybody from Sweden. That random networking piece enabled them to actually connect, which was nice. Um, and another literacy, collaboration. Giving students the chance to work together, to actually build something together. Again, that lets the pieces be more than, the whole be more than the sum of its parts is, is super important. Um, and the last one is really critical consumption. So, the empty coffee cup we're being increasingly trained to think about what we put in our bodies, okay? And when we think about where our coffee comes from, perhaps, and the fair trade conditions under which it was grown, and those are all really good things. We're trained to be critical consumers. Um, but I think we still need to work on helping our, our students be critical consumers of the media and information that they're taking in. And so those five pieces, they're very similar to Reingold's pieces, but not identical. Attention, um, critical consumption, collaboration. I've forgotten the other two. <laughs> Contribution. Just a minute. Go back. Connection. Right. Attention, contribution, connection, collaboration, and critical consumption are in my mind the kind of goals that fit the new ethos concept of what it means to teach, to help students become literate. And basically the pedagogical differences between the old school and the new school ways. When we are doing work that is pro product focused, that's mastery based, <laughs> that is bounded, that's about power relations, um, where we see copying as totally bad, um, where your authority is on, 
in the hat you wear rather than the relational reputation you build for yourself and where the audience is only the teacher, those are old ethos ways of approaching learning and they are not really network learning. If you're going to do network learning, you may want to think about working towards some of the things on the right hand side of the screen. Um, there are going to be times, again, where plagiarism is plagiarism and you know you can't have students copying each other's answers on text. The point of networked education is to be moving away from the tests so that the learning is differentiated enough that crowdsourcing answers is relevant because that's actually how most companies and workspaces operate now, um, but we aren't necessarily catching up with all of those literacies. The short form of this devices used only to consume, not to create or collaborate, are a wasted opportunity. Most of the teachers I know in North America would kill to have a one-to-one -one classroom. I hope to learn a great deal while I'm here and be able to take some of the how did you manage to make this happen back to where I live. Um, but we need to use it. And the last quick but, I'm a big believer in network learning. It doesn't mean that networks are inherently, magically equal. The power relations of our society play out in public networks, particularly. Um, this is an article about a, uh, a black woman who actually put up the photo of herself as a red-headed, bearded guy for a few months on Twitter uh, and got a significantly minimized amount of hateful spam, death threats, rape threats, because she has a very public identity and being in networks in the high end of the public can be a pretty hardcore thing right now. And as we teach our students network literacies, we need to model equitable relations and thinking about identities because networks always, every node is an identity, right? And how you relate to other people in that network, the power relations you enact makes it a nice place to communicate in or not a nice place to communicate in. And if your classroom has hierarchies to start with, those will just show up online. You need to, you need to work towards getting rid of them. They don't just go away. Basically, the last word. Networked, teacher-led communities that study their practice together. I love the fact that you folks are here today. I appreciate the fact that you're here. And um, I want to encourage you to be teachers and learners as you go forward in your amazing one-to-one -one system. And now I'll go, we'll go to Fika, and I will look at the challenges of one-to-one -one so I can learn from you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>